All right, today we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Ephesians chapter 4. And starting with verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way and through him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds up itself up in love. Now, there's a, a story of a man who was boarding a train in Perth, Australia, who had slipped and in the gap of a train carriage and the station platform where he had actually got his leg, uh, had gotten caught. Now, there were passengers aboard that train who actually came quickly to his rescue to try and set his leg free. And then by doing so, they all got together and were able to, with all their might, lift this train and set the man's leg free. Now, those who witnessed saw that because of the majority of people who had pitched in and helping in were able to have victory in helping someone, uh, a fellow person in need. Now, the train services spokesman who was interviewed there, he said, everyone sort of pitched in. It was was people power that saved someone from possibly quite serious injury. Now, this morning we're going to be talking about building unity in the body of Christ. Now, this certain passage here that we looked at, uh, the title is, uh, chapter 4, is Unity in the Body of Christ. If you see that in your, uh, in, depending on the version of your Bible, but it is building, um, I'm going to be talking about the building of the unity. So the building part is the, the verb, you know, how do we go about doing this? How do we have unity within a body? Now, the church is the body of Christ. It's a group of people unified under Christ, as Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 states. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 17 says, The purpose of God's church is to reflect Him to the world. Now, you will find in the church today, it is joined of people of different backgrounds, different talents, who all provide training and opportunities for God's work. Now, it is as Pastor Ed has said in the past, that we are definitely a weird herd. I mean, you look around and you see the different, you know, different color. You know, we come in different color, shapes, and sizes. Um, I love what Robert um, Fulgham said. He said, we could learn a lot from a box of crayons. Some are sharp, some are pretty, some are dull, while others bright. Some have weird names, but they all have learned to live together in the same box. This is what it means uh, for you and I to be a Christian. And this is what Christ wants for you and I, that we are to be able to work together to accomplish his will and carry out his purpose. Now, I tell you when we work together for the purpose of God's kingdom, not letting any of our differences get in the way of moving forward with the task that is set before us, we can do un explainable things, uh, unexpeakable things. It's amazing what we can do as when we are unified as one. And we do this through God's power, and, our, and God's power is so great that he can easily turn 800 billion enemy tanks into fine powder and just a flutter of an eyelash. You know, never, never for any reason should we lose sight of the victory that God has given us. You know, 
don't let the lies of the enemy propaganda fool you and penetrate your mind and thinking otherwise. Now, we should re- remember this command. It says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. And this is what God says to Isaiah in chapter 41, verse 10. So if you, excuse me, so if he is with us through any trial we may face as a church, we must never lose our courage. You know, a blind, anemic, weak-kneed flea on crutches has a better chance of defeating a stampeding herd of elephants than the enemy does of defeating God. So, again, you can look to Scripture and trust in his promises and then the victory that he has given us. So with that in mind, we'll look at the first point I want to make about how God builds unity in the body of Christ. And the we'll be looking at three main points. And the first one is God equips his people for work. Now, uh, I was not able to give uh, an outline so that there's not going to be an outline up here, but I'll definitely fill you in and letting you know uh, how many points there are and, and things like that. So I won't leave you hanging. So again, chapter, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 12 says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Now, we find no finer example in Scripture for leadership than the example that is given by Jesus Christ. He stated, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now, it is within this verse that we see the perfect description of a Christian leader. He is the one who acts as the shepherd to those sheep in his care. Now, when Jesus referred to us as sheep, this wasn't necessarily a compliment. You look at the nature of sheep. Sheep are easily confused. They're easily skittish. They're actually one of the dumbest creatures in the animal kingdom. And again, I mean, sheep have that very nature when afraid. I mean, they often pee on themselves. I mean, they're not very uh, wise or necessarily uh, an animal that would, you would give a compliment to. Now, a stray sheep even within close range of a herd can even still be disoriented, confused, frightened, and lose its way. And when a stray sheep comes across any hungry predator, it, predator, it is the most helpless and defenseless animal. Now, there are even uh, stories of entire herds of sheep drowning themselves uh, because they are so disoriented. So again, Jesus did not call a sheep as a compliment, but is to give us this uh, warning and that, uh, as a sense of caution that, hey, we are in need, desperate need of a shepherd. And as Paul gives in this scripture, he's saying a part of the unity, part of building up unity in the faith, in the body of Christ, is that we have leaders. Now, this passage here we are talking about mentions leadership, those who are apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers because they begin, they begin the process and help influence unity in the body. The, the shepherd's many roles to his uh, sheep is that he leads, he feeds, nurtures, he comforts, he cares for those who are in his need. And he also protects uh, the flock of God. So the main drive behind the motivation of a shepherd of God's flock is to lead them by modeling a godliness or righteousness uh, in his own life. And he cr- encourages that lifestyle and so that others may follow as well. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, a, uh, a pastor traveled to many different churches, and in doing so, he observed the, the attitude and the, the, the words that were spoken of the congregation and that is the, con- the words that were spoken within a, uh, a prayer group. Say, if, if, they, if he, li- he would listen to the prayers that were being spoken by the congregation, and he heard uh, similar um, similarity. There was a common uh, denominator between all these things, and it was that the congregation would often imitate the, their leaders, the words of their leaders or their pastors. You could hear the words that were being spoken. They were actually from the words of their pastors. So, I think we 
do as Paul said, that is to follow the example of our, of, of our leaders subconsciously. Uh, that is why it is so important that you pray for your leaders, who is often, who is often at target in a team. It's often the team leader. So again, know that your leaders are often the main target uh, within a church. Satan, there would, Satan would love nothing more than to bring down a leader because once the leader is gone, like we said before, we, we come back to that nature of a sheep. We are lost, disoriented, confused. There is no unity within the body. And we go about and disperse. So again, this is why Paul is mentioning that uh, leaders in this passage because it's definitely one of the main important, uh, a main important essence of a body. Now, I want to make clear that my message is not about the role of leadership, but the reason Paul, again, mentions leaders is because they are a very, they are, uh, an essence in practicing unity in the faith. So unity in the faith is maintained and perfected when the message of, uh, of God's word is accepted. So your leaders who give God's word expound on that, and you were to go home, research these things, observe God's word, to see if these things are true, and then we come to an acceptance of God's word and an acceptance to the, uh, to the teachings of your leaders. <clears throat> now, we don't, it mentions apostles. Now, we don't have apostles anymore. That is, an apostle was somebody who's seen the risen Christ with their own eyes. Again, we don't have any more apostles within the church, nor do we have anyone prophesying or giving us some kind of a new revelation to scripture. Um, but again, he mentions evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Those are the ones who expound on what God has already given us. So by accepting that, you practice unity. Remember that it is not up to your leaders to make the decisions for the whole church. And this is, again, this is what we practice here at Family of Faith, that it is not up to just your leaders to make the decisions. But uh, if we, as leaders, believe God is speaking to us, we will, again, reveal this to the congregation, leave it up to you to make a decision. That, and if we are not all in agreement, we pray that we would all come to a consensus that we can move forward. <clears throat> now again, we work as a whole. The next part I want to s get to is that we become participators or participants in the body of Christ. Now, God doesn't just give us teachers and leaders so that we can be satisfied with the knowledge that we have about Jesus, but that we can carry out and fulfill our duties as Christians. In verse 12, Paul says, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, in that verse, there's a word that people seem to shudder at when they hear it. And that is service. See, God is preparing you for works of service. Newton's first law of motion states that an object in motion tends to remain in motion, and an object at rest tends to remain at rest. This law applies to so many people, I, I think, in the attitude and, and the, mental, uh, the mentality towards service. There are those of us who are naturally driven to complete projects Others are apathetic, requiring motivation to overcome uh, inertia. Laziness is a lifestyle as well for some, but it is also a temptation for all of us. Now, we talked a few Sundays ago about how God has ordained work for man, and because of this very reason, laziness in any way is a sin. So, when you feel tempted to beat yourself on the couch uh, instead of doing what needs to be done, ask yourself, am I, using, am I making useful of the time that God has given me? Am I using this uh, to my benefit? Is this a wise thing that I do? Or perhaps opportunities to serve in church arise and you, are, you are, aren't motivated to take, up, take them up. Ask yourself, am I using the time and talents God has given me for him? You know, I love, I love watching documentaries on, on nature. The very, you know, it's very interesting to see animals' behavior and the way they live. And 
But one creature seems to always fascinate scientists and viewers, and even the Bible itself seems to bring to light this creature. And that is the ant. You know, there, I think if you want an example of a task master, there's def- de- the ant is definitely the one to go to. Uh, when you watch a series on elephants or hippos, rarely do you ever get one where you don't see the elephant or the hippo sunbathing in the mud. But, uh, you know, I've, I've never seen an ant just sitting still sunbathing. You know, there's, you know, I often see dogs. I see, you know, cats do that. But again, you never see an ant simply just doing nothing. See, an ant that does nothing is a dead ant. Ants are always moving. And here in Proverbs chapter uh, chapter 6, verse 6 through 8, it says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which have no, having no guide, no overseer, no ruler, provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Now, the largest ant colony that was ever found was 3,750 miles wide. And now you talk about working together to accomplish an amazing task, despite their size. You know, we have to ask yourself, can a mere ant and her initiative outdo us because we can't learn to work together? You know, if so, then heed the example that Scripture gives us and taking advice from the ant Look to the ant as an example that we may obtain power to do God's will. That we have, again, as we, it was said before by the, uh, by the spokesman in the interview, that we have people power. Now, the ant in this verse is an example of the Christian who knows the will of God. See, with the ant, it's always, it's always a grab, pull, lift, shove, move, move, move. It's always work, work, work. And again, we can take that example and apply it to ourselves. You know, another interesting fact about ants is the success in their ability to cooperate with numerous organisms around them, uh, like fungi. Now, fungi is that annoying, excuse me, annoying stuff that uh, turns your bread moldy, or perhaps that, that itch, that causes the itch between your toes. Now, for the ant, this is a very beneficial uh, food-sustaining uh, benefit for them. Uh, they take the fungi and apply that to their food because they can't just digest leaves alone. It's not good for them. They are not able to get the nutrition they need. So again, for certain species of ants, this is a life-sustaining benefit. Now, the partnership between uh, the ants and the fungi form a symbiosis, or it's a a term that is called uh, mutualism. That is, uh, an organism needs other organisms. They have to work together to, in order to s- sustain life. Now, without that, uh, without that fungi, actually, entire ant colonies can actually perish And uh, without that partnership. So, what is it that God is telling us, even throughout, script, uh, throughout nature, this process of, of mutualism? Again, it is that we need to learn to work together. With, and again, without partnership and finding mutual ground, we will perish. You know, without the partnership and learning to work together, we will perish as a church. You know, uh, uh, Jim had mentioned that, you know, some of the churches in his past that have actually began to die out. Uh, I, I think one of those reasons is because they, there was no building of unity. There was no unity within the body. And this is often uh, the symptom because there is no unity that eventually they fall apart and eventually the the church uh, is extinguished. But again, Scripture is giving us this warning that we are to hold fast and stay firm, that we keep Scripture in our hearts, that we are to practice this unity. And again, this is what Paul is getting at, that we practice unity in the faith, that we would not perish. See, as we see God's vision for a, um, and for a new pastor heed this warning that dissension will arise not just from outside the church but also within the church there may be dissension there may be things that cause us to split during this even this process but again hold fast and stay firm to scripture and holding that to our hearts that we are to build each other up in love so again it's important that we learn to work together and overcome our differences for the sake of the gospel 
reaching out, um, that it is able to reach out to this community that we are continuing to further God's kingdom. See, what good is it that we are in constant battle over petty things and the gospel never reaches this community? See, when we take up scripture and accept the teachings of scripture, what we do is we actually advance toward spiritual maturity and uh, growing up in all aspects of Christ, which um, Ephesians is telling us. Now, in, as a Christian, you are given a new nature. We are motivated to diligence and productiveness out of a love for our Savior, again, to accomplish what he wants because he has redeemed us for that very purpose. It says that he has redeemed us for good works. But again, make sure your motivation is produced by a love for the Lord. Now, I've heard reasons why people leave this church. You know, they... they or perhaps the reason why they stay, you know, pro- probably is because of the, they like the pastor. Not necessarily his preaching, but they, they like who he is as a person. You know, they, uh, they like the teaching of uh, the Sunday school. They love the teachers. You know, they love certain uh, church members. But again, if your motivation stays for anything else but Jesus, you've missed the whole point of the church and the reason why we are here. See, this church thing is not, our idea. This was Jesus' idea, and it's seen throughout this, the Gospels that Jesus said that this was that He was going to build His church. This is not our idea, but this church belongs to Christ. <clears throat> See, God wants to use us to help up to uh, to help in building up His church, and that's why it says in verse twelve, "God prepares you for the works of service." that the body of Christ may be built up. Now in verse 13, it says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Now I've heard the, the testimonies and stories of those who have no desire to join a uh, local church. You know, they'll hold their own uh, church services within their own homes. Uh, you know, the, the reasons why is because they think that the church has strayed away from the teachings of Christ, the teaching of the Bible. And so they have, they think the safest place is for them to stay at home and to teach their own family the, the word of God. Uh, I, you know, it's very crucial that we be a part of our church home, of our church family. You know, I've, I've said this, if you're going to grow up alone, you're going to grow up weird. You know, you're going to learn all kinds of strange doctrines. You're going to learn all different things, you know, believe in your own understandings. And again, uh, to reiterate, this is why God gave us leaders. That We're expounding that you're able to dissension between truth and error. You know, not trusting in your own understanding, but again, what does Scripture have to say? <clears throat> now, you can often tell where a person comes from when you ask them, you know, where, uh, where do you fellowship? And they say, I don't fellowship. Well, you can probably guess this person is, again, straying away and believing all kinds of weird doctrines. So it's important that we stay in unity and to a local family of tr- um, believers and that we heed the example of our leaders. And again, this is how we grow up in maturity. In verse 14, Paul says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. See, people remain infants in their understanding of Scripture and even they remain infants in their commitment to one another because they are very inadequate in discerning between truth and error or how to read God's word in context. And again, not just will you, not only will your doctrine uh, be infant, but again, your attitude will be that of an infant. And it'll be hard for you to work with other people. See, Christian maturity requires a radical change of one's priorities. When, once you become a Christian, all your priorities become reorganized. You will begin to reorganize those things in your life. You know, your spouse, you know, how do what do you deem more important than God? <clears throat> See, the key to maturity is, as I've said once, it is con- consistency and perseverance in doing the things we know honor God and will ultimately bring us closer to him. 
See, there are those certain things called spiritual, uh, spiritual disciplines. That is, uh, spiritual dif- disciplines are uh, like Bible reading, prayer, uh, fellowship, service, and stewardship. Those are our Bible, uh, excuse me, our scripture, <laughs> excuse me, spiritual discipline. Uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 tells us that we're to walk by the Spirit. Now, the Greek word used there for walk actually means to walk with a purpose in view. Now, later on in that same chapter, Paul tells us again to walk by the Spirit. But it, in this case, the word translated there means step by step or one step at a time. And this is, again, in reference to our spiritual maturity. It doesn't matter where you are as long as you're continuing to take those baby steps. Remember, God is pleased with those baby steps. Never be uh, too hard on yourself if you're not where you think you should be. But remember, God rejoices in those baby steps. You know, you look at the joy of, of parents. You know, you often see like on Facebook, people video, you know, posting videos of their baby walking or the, the things that, they're, you know, they're, uh, that their children do. All those little things mean so much to a parent. So how much more would it mean to God when you take those baby steps? Again, I think we, are, we have in us the image of God, the very essence of God. And so it's an example and an illustration of parenting, of how God looks at us. And I think it's rightly, it, it describes us rightly when the Bible calls us children of God. God looks at us in delight when we take those baby steps. So again, we're continuing to walk by the Spirit, or that is, continuing with our, matur- our maturity in the faith. <clears throat> now, when we walk by the Spirit, to walk means to wa- um, you're walking under the instruction of another. That is, for us, the Holy Spirit. We walk under His instruction. So we are filled with the Spirit, but know that every day you need to pray that you are filled with the Spirit. See, you can't gain any more of the Spirit. You can't gain any more of, God's, um, of the Holy Spirit. But again, Christ gave you all of His Spirit, but you can be filled with other things in your day, like television, uh, movies, toys, friends, spouse. You can make all kinds of idols and leave uh, no room for the Spirit. So again, this is how, again, we are obtaining that maturity every day that we are allowing the Holy Spirit room in our lives every day. <clears throat> Now, that's what Paul says in verse 13, that you become mature, attaining to the whole measure and the fullness of Christ. See, the reason we strive for spiritual maturity is so that we don't fall into false doctrine tossed back and forth by waves, uh, uh, like waves. You know, when we establish the requirements of membership here and family of faith, it was done as a whole church where we came to a consensus as this was, uh, we came to an agreement. This is the requirements for membership. <clears throat> and again, this is how we practiced unity, that we, became, that we came to an agreement, not causing dissension. Now, there's nothing in Scripture that outline, outlines this is how church membership should go or this is how church membership should run. Now, the New Testament churches uh, apparently had no need of formal membership. That is the early church back in Je- um, after Jesus' death and Uh, Paul's ministry, there was uh, really no need of formal membership, but it was a reliance on God to gather together uh, the the, the people of God. However, we know in the early church, salvation was a prerequisite, um, excuse me, prerequisite for becoming a member of the body of Christ. This was what you had to do first, was become, was have salvation, have evidence of that to join a church. And again, the reason why I bring that up is because by not doing this, we invite wolves into the body of Christ. Those who appear to be Christians but cause destruction, they spread gossip, they are self-serving. And again, there's no unity in that. It does, it's not a practice of unity. They, 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 there's a division. So church membership was important, especially when under persecution, you needed to know who you can trust, who you could go to. And Paul himself gave approval of certain believers in the New Testament. And he even calls them out, saying that they, these were false converts. And he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, he says, For Demas has forsaken me. And it says the reason why. It said the reason because he had loved 
this present world. He had loved the things of this world. And in doing so, he departed from Paul. He was not a part of the ministry anymore. So again, he excluded him from the ministry because he proved to be of no use to him. We don't exclude people because we uh, believe we have a holier-than-thou attitude, but because, again, this isn't our church. This is God's church. This belongs to God. And again, we are trying to restore the uh, integrity of the church, restoring that, uh, uh, the purity of the church. You know, I, I remember when we, uh, for, when we first, uh, before we established the covenant, we went through a book, and, and that was uh, the integrity of the church. And it is amazing how, how far the churches in the U.S. have strayed away from keeping the integrity of the church, that we are not practicing unity. Years ago in Russia, there, uh, uh, when Russia was in communism, the story of two Russian soldiers, soldiers came bursting into a uh, worship service, and they shouted, if you're not ready to die for your faith, get out of here. And half of those professing Christians left. Now, after they had left, the soldiers had put down their guns and pulled out their Bibles, and they said, we're Christians, but we didn't want to risk fellowship until we sorted out the sheep from the goats. I think if persecution fell upon Christians in the U.S., I think one thing that it would do is that it would actually clear out the church of murmurers, those who spread gossip, those who are uh, so-called uh, Christians. Uh, it would help to purify the church. And again, what, would it, would, what it, it would do was actually help us to uh, maintain that unity because again, persecution is a part of God's plan for us as Christians. Under persecution, we draw closer to God. We draw closer to one another. <clears throat> now in verse 15, Paul says, Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. Now, main maintaining unity in the faith must be based on an active love that seeks to resolve problems and reconcile differences be, by mutual uh, loyalty and obedience to Christ. And again, to his word. Now, this also means that holding and speaking the truth of God's word have priority over loyalty to Christian traditions, uh, individual people, or, and even the visible church. See, one of the main reasons churches split is because we hold on so dearly to our traditions. We think this is the re uh, way it's been done for years, uh, and again, we become accustomed to those things and we want nothing else but that. And it's, again, it can be very crippling when you come into a new church and that is your mindset that just because a church does things differently in a certain way, this should not uh, be your way of uh, dictating whether or not this is the church for you. But again, one of the things that we should do as Christians is go to, to God in prayer. Is this the place where I should fellowship. And some of the questions we should ask ourselves is, do they believe in the promises of God? Are they a loving and welcoming church? Do they call what sin is, that is, sin? Does this church uh, have a pastor that treats his wife with respect and is a man of the word? And does he have a humble and gentle heart? And again, listen closely to the teachings. Does it glorify God? Does it magnify who Jesus is, and edify one another. Those are the things we should look for, and those are the things you should look for in one another. Now, the last point I want to make is that through all this process of unity, we help one another grow. Paul says in verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, your spiritual maturity will be in part because of how well your, fam your church family feeds you. Know that we will love one another, we'll encourage one another, we'll lift each other up in prayer, and also we will challenge one another. See, people often don't like to be challenged, but again, this is an essence of being a part of a church family, is that uh, we have a Christian attitude towards this, a Christ-like manner towards uh, being challenged. Again, you will give thanks for your challenges. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8 says, Do not rebuke mockers, or they will hate you. 
Rebuke the wise, and they will love you. I remember times when I was corrected by a fellow uh, brother in Christ, a fellow Christian brother, and at the time I felt, uh, I felt angry. You know, I, at, I felt you know, that I had to justify my actions because they were correcting me. I thought, you know, who is this? How dare you correct me, you know, you know, and try to put me back on track. But it was, again, that was my pride. That, I had an, uh, an attitude of pride. And again, we have to look outside of that and examine ourselves. Go home and examine. I, I have to go home and examine myself. I had to say, okay, am I in the wrong? And if I was, I had to confess, repent, and then move forward. Now, now that I look back in those situations, I thank my fellow brother for that. I thank for the correction that he gave me. At the time, it was, uh, it hurt. I mean, it was painful. And again, this is what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 says. No discipline seems enjoyable for the time being, but, but painful. But nevertheless, however, it yields the fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I am grateful for those who corrected me. And again, you will be thankful for those who correct you. See, when we challenge one another, don't take it as an offense, but maybe I do need to examine myself. Humble yourself before your brother and before the Lord. Now, pride often gets, us, uh, gets the better of us, and this is actually what causes wars. It's a, I'm right, you're wrong, or they're right, I'm wrong. See, the, uh, the evidence of your maturity in the faith is that you love your brother. You will have that maturity in humbling yourself before one another. You know, the old saying is true, birds of a feather flock together, and this is a perfect illustration of Christians uh, in a church. We gather together for the breaking of bread. That is communion. We gather together for the teaching of the word, for fellowship, and uh, stewardship, for love, for one another, service, and again, we are working together for the same cause. That is the furtherance of God's kingdom here on earth. You know, I tell you this because I don't want you to become what is called a spiritual butterfly. That is, you flutter from church to church. You're con constantly flying around seeking a church and never landing uh, your wings. So, you know, I, I, I love what Edmund Burke said about the disunity. He said, Whatever disunits man from God also disunits man from man. So your relationship with God will be a reflection of how you deal with one another. Jesus said, they will know, um, they will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Yes, we will get on one another's nerves. We will, at times, um, hurt one another. We will have resentment. But again, don't let the negative outweigh the positive. See, I believe God gave us low-maintenance people and high-maintenance people for a reason. See, the low-maintenance people are, are there so you have time to deal with the high-maintenance ones. So again, before we uh, go to that place of resentment, remember your, God's commands for loving one another, that we have unity in that. Now, before we close, I want to just summarize, again, the whole idea of this, uh, of building up. Overall, this is God's plan for us, that despite our many differences, we learn to work together. We have so many different gifts and talents. And it's important that we use those talents for the building up of the body of Christ. This is what Paul meant when he said, the whole body joints and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love. See, we need our teachers. We need our leaders. We need those who serve, usher, greet, those who weep for others, and those who give to others as well. And in doing so, we build up this church of Christ in love as, uh, as we each do our part. We were meant to work in unity and benefit from one another, one another <clears throat> not split. I remember back when I uh, exercised horses, uh, when you, before you brought a horse out to a, a gallop, that is a, uh, a run, you, you often start out with a, what is called posting or a post. Now, this is where you match the rhythm of a horse, and it's a, usually a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So you use your legs to match the body movement of a horse. And again, in doing so, you, 
you are in sync with the horse, that you're able to mo- keep moving forward. Now, if you be- go out of sync, you can cause your horse to be confused and oftentimes frustrated. And this is usually how you end up on the ground. And this is how I often ended up on the ground because I was out of sync at- with the horse. And again, it was the unity. It was the matching the rhythm that you can, it was a, a nice even flow that you can continue the process of exercising. Again, you know, unity is found all throughout Scripture. It is all, um, and uh, nature. God is a God of order and or, um, an organization, and we see that. And this is what God's plan is for the church: that we are continuing to work uh, to build unity in the faith. <clears throat> Let us close up in a word of prayer.